Song of Invitation is number eight for those in the back. Very good to be with you tonight. You saw it? Can you hear me in the back? Okay, do I need to start streaming? Stephen, what do you think? Stephen Bullard, can you hear me okay? All right. Some of you are saying no. We'll give them a moment to work on it. I got the green on. How about now? How about now? Don't, don't answer. I already know the answer. I hear myself. I'm so thankful to be with you tonight. I'm very grateful to the congregation, the elders, for the privilege to get to preach at this meeting. It's a great meeting, and I'm thankful for it. Every year I get farther away from being a teenager. And I'll always be young in the eyes of a lot of you. But as I get older and get farther away from the teens and I can't keep up with some of the things that you say and do, you know, I'm still working on flipping the water bottle that you guys figured out five years ago. I'm working on my dad jokes. So you can find the teens. But I want to tell you this. I love teens. I love our teens. I love the hope and the vivacity that teens bring to the church. I love how you're part of the church presently. I love how you're the future of the church. And so I hope tonight that this sermon speaks to you. Even though I might be using language that you don't connect with. So I'll be speaking about the family. But teens, I'm speaking to you too. Okay? What exactly do you think of when you hear the term ancient altars. Now, when studying the Bible, if you start in the book of Genesis and move onwards from there, you'll find that an ancient altar was just a pile of rocks. And what can we know about this pile of rocks? Well, we know that patriarchs and the early days of the children of Israel, that they would stack these rocks up and they would offer burnt offerings on them, among other things. Uh, we know that they were used out of rough stone wherever people were camping. So if you're in the desert, which is where they most likely were, they're using a desert type of stone. If you're in the forest, you're using forest rocks. It's whatever rocks are around, that's the rocks you use. We also know that God commanded the early patriarchs, and the, specifically the early days of the children of Israel, that these altars were not to be carved or decorated, but rather it was just get the stones and stick them in place and use that for your burnt offering. <coughs> Now, the common reasoning for why it was that way was that no human work or artistry could ever improve on what it looked like because what mattered was that you did what God said. And when you, when you did what God said and you used the rocks that you had, it was pleasing to the Lord. So is that it? Question. Is that it? Is that all we can gain from altars, a big pile of rocks? Well, obviously there's more to it than that. They had several purposes, and I'd like to suggest tonight that we have some really amazing parallels uh, between these piles of rocks and our families. And I, especially for those of you who take notes, I have this up there. I love note takers, so I try to be organized for your sake. Uh, take a moment to write this down in the next five seconds, because that's about all you get. But it is a slow burn. It's going to take a little bit before we get to families. We need to spend some time appreciating the ancient altar. And so I invite you to pay special attention as we begin, shall we? The first altar that we have recorded in the Bible comes from Genesis chapter 8. And I don't know, uh, rather, I don't believe that it was the first altar that was ever built, but it is the first one that's recorded. And it says in Genesis 8.20, Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Noah establishes a pattern that all altars follow, or rather all uh, elements of atonement follow, and that is a priest, an altar, and a sacrifice. And so we can see uh, Noah here is the priest, and he built an altar, a place where he could offer burnt offerings or burnt sacrifices. And I would suggest to you that no matter what covenant it is in the Bible, in the patriarchal age, 
in the Mosaic Age and in the Christian Age, when it comes to atonement, that means the, the forgiving of sins, the, the wiping away the debt that we have with God, it involves a priest, it involves a sacrifice, and that sacrifice is paid on an altar. Now, let's consider some uses of these ancient altars that you'll see across the Old Testament. The primary reason that people built altars was for blood sacrifice, just like we saw in Genesis chapter 8. Or if you look in the Law of Moses in Leviticus 1, 4 and 5, from Adam through the priesthood, people, uh, rather, uh, patriarchs and priests would kill animals as sacrifices for sin. It was through this innocent sacrifice that guilty could be pardoned. Write down Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, where the writer very plainly says, sins cannot be forgiven without a blood sacrifice. Why blood? It's gross, right? There's, it gets messy. But Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, talks about how life is in the blood. And there's nothing more precious than life. It doesn't matter how much gold you put on that altar or any other sort of fine metal or money or whatever, you could always find more of that. But there's only one amount of precious blood that that animal or our Savior could give. It's the most precious thing that one could give. Well, besides that primary reason of blood sacrifice, you can see that ancient altars were also used for thanksgiving. And people could uh, bring these offerings of devotion and praise to God. They expressed it in their grain offerings and in their peace offerings. But then it transitions from an offering to a memorial. This is a really neat part of the study, and I really enjoyed it whenever I went through it myself. And we find in the book of Joshua specifically, after the law of Moses is completed and it moves into a narrative retelling of, of the history of those people, that they would build altars in addition to their altar of burnt offering. For example, they had an altar of inquiry in Joshua chapter 4, verse 1 through 9, when uh, the Jordan River is miraculously stopped and they cross on dry ground. God commands Joshua to have each tribe choose a man, and each man had to pick up a big old rock out of the riverbed. You know that these 12 tribes, especially men, are going to be very competitive about how big that rock can be. So now that they are just really trying to get out of that riverbed. And then they had to carry that rock all day long. And in the evening, they set up, in the words of Joshua 4, an altar. But that altar wasn't for burnt offering. It was to inquire about God. So that when future generations would come and they'd say, what in the world is this big pile of rocks here for? People could say who knew, ah, this is here to remind us of God's power. And he was so powerful that he could stop the Jordan River and he crossed on dry ground. In addition to inquiry, there was also memorials of unity and witness. And I'll combine these two into one from Joshua chapter 22. It's at the very end of the book. It's at the very end of their history. Now they've conquered the promised land. There was two and a half tribes who crossed back over to the eastern side of the river, right? They had a lot of flocks. They wanted to go back to where there was a lot of pasture land. And when they crossed over, they built a big stone altar. Now the nine and a half tribes hear that they built this altar, and they immediately get very upset thinking, they built an altar, a burnt offering. This pagan altar has to be brought down, and we need to kill them. And so they get the army together, and they're going to cross over, and they're going to kill the two and a half tribes. This is a great lesson in jumping to conclusions, by the way. Thankfully, cooler heads prevail, and a delegation is sent to cross, and they say, why in the world did you build this big pile of rocks? And the children of Israel, the two and a half tribes, say to them, we built this because this barrier of the river, we didn't want our future generations to, to forget that we were Israelites. There's unity, there's heritage in this, it's not meant for burnt offerings at all. We know we need to come to where the tabernacle is to do that. But this is to remind our children and your children that we are one. And then, in Joshua 22, verse 34, it specifically says that the children of God called the altar witness. They wanted to bear witness that they were children of God. And so these altars serve a lot of great purposes. And so uh, as we move into the next part of our sermon. I want to pause for a moment and show you this chart. We're going to be skipping uh, in great detail this center column here. 
However, I want to just briefly explain what it's about because it's a whole other sermon in a series about rocks that I'm working on. So me and five-year-olds really love rocks. And uh, so this would be a great sermon for them as well. Uh, but there is a primary New Testament pattern that we see, and that's where the New Testament reveals what things are. It's called type and anti-type. So these are the types, the blood sacrifice on the altar, etc. And then it fulfills itself in the anti-type of the New Testament. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10, it says, We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals which blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priests for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. And the thought goes on. It's, this is an incomplete thought, but it's serving the purpose of explaining that we have an altar. And it follows the pattern, right? Priest, altar, sacrifice. And what's so special about the Christian faith is that Jesus is our perfect priest, our perfect sacrifice, who was sacrificed on this spiritual altar when he was crucified for our sins. And this spiritual altar furnishes a spiritual feast for us. Notice how the, everything lines up just right. There's a blood sacrifice that Jesus had to give. And in the, in the next verse afterwards, Hebrews 13, 15, it talks about how we offer the fruit of our lips as a thanksgiving offering because of what Jesus did. And every Sunday we come together to, in the memorial fashion, remember what Jesus did. And we inquire about it. We're, we're supposed to have the right thinking. Not just the right actions, but the right thinking. We have to be inquiring about Jesus on the cross. There's unity when we share one loaf and one cup. And as everybody passes that around, we bond together. We are one in Christ Jesus. And it serves as a witness memorial. We proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. So every time I eat from the bread and I drink that cup, I proclaim the Lord's death. It is a witness for what He's done. Are you getting goosebumps? Isn't it great seeing these connections in the Bible? Well, we're going to spend the majority of this time in the final column, talking about our families, specifically shifting to the family altar. Now, what do I mean when I say the family altar? I had to add this couple of sentences in here because at home, uh, a sister approached my wife after I gave the sermon to inquire, is he really saying we've got to bring rocks into our house? The answer is no. We are not building real altars, real uh, physical altars, that is. In fact, I'll go on to say this. The family altar is not a physical location. It's not a replacement for the worship of the church. It's not a rigid checklist of these things where if I just do these things, that's all I have to do and I never have to talk about God any other time. And it's not a silver bullet. And specifically about that last point, you know, you might not know yet what the family altar is. And so you're thinking, I don't really know what you're talking about yet. These will all make sense as we go through the study. I assure you. But I want to say a word about the family altar and how it's not a silver bullet. As we try to motivate each other as families to build up our altars, we have to recognize that God gave each one of us free will. And so it is not my intention to offer this suggestion or plan and then families feel guilty because some of their family members have decided not to obey God. This isn't a silver bullet. Each must decide for themselves if they will obey God or not. What it is, and what my intention is, is to admonish and encourage us. We are all in this together. Our families are one in Christ Jesus when we gather as the church, but then when we go home, we should be encouraging each other as we build our family altar. So what is it? The family altar is a mindset and a practice. Specifically, it's the mindset and practice of consistent or regular interaction between your family and God. Now, you could call it a number of things, and there's a number of activities that could go into what the family altar is. Some people might call it what they do Bible time, or their family devotion, or family worship, or uh, creating a Christ culture. There's so many vocabulary terms, and it might be a little confusing. But all of these are working together 
to foster the concept of I want to build an altar in the same figurative way, or figuratively in the same way that the ancients did, where wherever they went, the first thing they did when they set up camp was they built an altar. And I want my home to be like that. I want to have this connection to God the way His people always have. So, returning to our chart, we know that there's five altar purposes, blood sacrifice, thanksgiving, inquiry, unity, and bearing witness. How does this relate to the family altar? Well, think about what we're supposed to be doing with our families. Your family is supposed to be coming into contact with the blood of Jesus Christ through understanding what His blood accomplishes. Now, it can't replace what we do at, at, when the church gathers together and celebrates with the communion memorial. It's not meant to replace that. But that should not be the only time that the blood of Jesus is spoken about. Our families must regularly come into contact with the cross. Your family is your mission field. Don't wait for others to convert your children because there are others who are not members of the church who want to convert your children out of the church. So, the family altar serves as a time to think about the blood sacrifice of Jesus. It's a time of thanksgiving when we at home are modeling what we do when we get together at church. If you come to church one hour a week on a Sunday morning, and that's the only time you're thankful for Jesus, you're really missing out on great opportunities to show your family all that Jesus has done for you. And then we have an opportunity to inquire. You know, sometimes you gather with the church and we have on our best clothes and uh, we speak our best words. And so we really are on our best behavior. And some, there, there's some questions that you're afraid to ask because you fear, you fear that everybody else has got it figured out and you don't. That's what makes the family such a safe place, what it should be. A safe place, an open space, so that you can ask questions. Like little ones who ask, who made God? Right? Where does God come from? Or teenagers who ask, how do, how do we know the Bible can be trusted? Or even more sensitive questions like, I don't know if God me. Or I don't know if I love God. This is a place of inquiry. It's a place of unity where we as a family, uh, we come together to express that unity we have. And it's not, you know, we're not chanting our family name, you know, Edwards, Edwards. That's not what the unity memorial is about. But rather it's to say, for example, our family, the Edwards, that we are one with Jesus. And what a privilege it is as the Edwards to be one. Whatever your family name is, you work that as well. And I'll say this. Strong families make strong churches. Weak families make weak churches. And the Bible is full of pattern after pattern after pattern where one generation of God's people is faithful and the next is not. And we don't know all the reasons for why uh, that changes one generation from the next, but I can assure you that strong families make strong churches and weak families do the opposite of it. So it's important that we have family unity, especially when we go through the tough times, when our families are tested through trials. It is the unity of faith that binds a family together. Finally, there is a witness memorial where you are bearing witness to your family that Jesus is coming soon. And that everyone in your family, when they, each, then when they reach the age of accountability, will stand before God based off their faithful <laughs> obedience. And that mom and dad... They can't ride your coattails into heaven. They can't ride the coattails of their favorite preacher into heaven or of anyone else, but that we are responsible to God. And so the family altar is bearing witness that Jesus will come again and we will face God in judgment. So what are we to make of this? Now that we've got this really neat chart, it's okay if you want to take your phone out and take a picture. I've seen some of you do it already in a very sly way. I'm very okay with you if you want to take a picture real quick. Uh, we build a family altar purpose of this and putting it next to these other columns is to show the value of saving your family. Remember, the family altar is mindset plus practice of regular interaction between God and your family. It's not a physical altar, and this is the last important concept I'm going to use, and I will repeat it several times from this point on. Use the rocks you have. Families look different, right? So uh, this is what I mean by family. It could mean a family of two who are married, a husband and a wife. 
Could mean a family of five. There's children in the home. Could mean a family of ten. There are, it's a multi-generational home. There may be grandparents or an aunt or an uncle that are living with you. Could be a family of one. Young professionals, you've moved out of home. You're in college now. Maybe you're, you have a job now and you're on your own. You're still a family. Use the rocks you have. All families might look different as far as the people that make up that home, but here's the fact. All families need regular interaction with Jesus. Don't wait till you've got someone else in your home before you start building your family altar. Young people especially, you want to become that person that's most attractive to a future mate, start working on your family altar. Build it up so that when they see you, they see a young woman or a young man of faith now, and not one who's waiting to find someone before they get started. Well, Jesus said to a man, oh, look at this, right there, use the rocks you have. We'll keep going with that sentiment. Jesus said to a man who had been healed, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how much He's had mercy on you. In the context of this, uh, this region of people became afraid of Jesus because He healed uh, this demon-possessed man. And so now the demon-possessed man wants to go with Jesus across the lake because uh, nobody else wants Jesus there. And Jesus says to him, no, you need to go back and tell your family about how the Lord had mercy on you, what He's done for you. And so Jesus leaves. The, the former demoniac goes around. He starts telling his family. And he tells everyone. So much so that when Jesus comes back across the lake the next time, everyone's clamoring to get to Him. Why? somebody went home and they talked about the mercy of the Lord and what He had done for them. May that be a motivation for us as we build our family altar. The charge for you and me is to go home and to build the family altar. Now, how do I bring my family into consistent interaction with God? I think when you look at scriptures for this, there are a lot of think-sos we can say, but I want to do my best to have the scriptures as our guide. I don't know if there's any scriptures in here that you haven't already read, that you haven't already considered, and you haven't already using. Uh, this is meant to be an encouragement. And I know a lot of family altars are very successful out there, and you're doing a great job. So may this encourage what you're doing. If you are wondering, how am I supposed to do this? May this encourage you how to start. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, the Bible says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Now I want you to listen to these words because they may sting. But a person who does not have a loving relationship with God cannot hope to express a loving relationship to the members of their family. So I want to start with you and with your heart. You have to love the Lord with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength if you hope for your family to do the same. Because the hypocrite's mask that you can put on and fool everybody else is most evident whenever you take it off at home and people see for who you really are. Now the next verse explains how God's covenant people in the Old Testament were to implement these commands on the family level. Verse 7, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. This verse frightens me. I feel so inadequate. Even now, when I read this scripture, when I look at what God expected of His covenant people, and I live under a superior covenant. Have you thought about this word, diligent? You shall teach them diligently to your children. It's from a Hebrew word which means to wet or sharpen. It's got the idea of taking that blade and you're making it as sharp as it can possibly be. Rhetorical question. What kind of instrument does a doctor want to use? A scalpel or a butter knife? Families. What kind of teaching should we be trying to do with one another? The kind where we are sharpening each other, to become that perfect tool for the Lord that can reach into the hearts of each other and others as well. How do we do that? Well, the Bible says that when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. I will tell you what this is not saying. This is not a four-point checklist. 
where the alarm clock strikes, you hit it, and you say, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. You run outside the house, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. You do it these four times and that's all you've got to do. That's not how we read this. This is a general command for a lifestyle, a mindset and practice, a lifestyle of building a family altar where God is central in the home. So that when you're getting up, when you're around the breakfast table, when the kids are being rushed out the door to school, while uh, if you homeschool whenever your kids are with you there, when they come home from school, and you are getting that chance to kind of decompress at the end of the day, when you're around the dinner table, when you're playing games, when you're at sporting events, all of the times whenever you're with your family, you are diligently teaching them. We have a responsibility to do that. Now, the New Testament reinforces that sentiment in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. The Bible says, And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Dads, fathers, I think I can also include husbands, men of faith, Future dads are single men who are preparing. What are you doing to bring them up? The Bible says we're bringing them up in training. We're bringing them up in admonition. We know that moms, we know that wives are involved in this process. Titus chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. But dad, you cannot excuse your duty. You cannot say, well, you know, I, uh, I work and I provide the space. And then my wife, she'll be the one that teaches our kids. I have no problem with wives, moms, and teaching your kids. But dads, you cannot give your duty to someone else that you have specifically been called to do. Dads, we are to train them up. You are called to do it. You have to do it. You have to do it. I don't know how much more emphatically I can say it, but Father, you are the spiritual leader of your home. And this is not one of those things that I thought it was whenever I was newly wed. I was like, all right, I get to be the head of the house. I get to boss everyone around. I get to, you know, my will be done whenever I come home to the castle. And every year that I've been married, every year that I've been a father, it is less and less about getting to boss, and the burden seems greater and greater and greater about bringing them up. There's a lot of times I don't want this responsibility. And maybe you don't either, but we have to do it. Look at look what Matthew chapter 18, verse 6 says. I think we can tie it into the family altar. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. That phrase, little ones, means a beginner in the faith. And that, that's, you know, everybody in the church who is a beginner in the faith. But isn't it also the ones in your home who are beginners in the faith? Through our neglect, through our absence, if we are not bringing them up, are we not causing them to sin, dads? And this isn't meant to, to be a, a guilt session on you. I'm grateful for dads. We've got a lot of great dads out there, great fathers, men of faith, who I look up to and admire. But dad, you have a great responsibility. The family altar, I've said it a lot and I'm going to say it more, is a mindset and practice. So we've talked about the mindset. We know we want to do it. But how are we going to do it? What, what exactly are we doing? That's the practice that we're going to talk about now. And so I'd like to offer some suggestions for the practice of building the family altar. Now I realize that we can be quite contrarian about people telling our families what to do. I'm that way. I'm, I'm very libertarian about it. You know, let me do my thing and you do your thing. And I don't really want you to give me advice unless you know, you're uh, 100 years older than me and you've got great, great grandchildren and you've helped all five generations get through. It's hard to hear others offer suggestions. And so what I would like to implore is please have mercy. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful. So let's be merciful with one another as we go through these suggestions. And I'll also say that many of you already do the things I'm going to be suggesting tonight. This, is, this should be a reinforcement of what families are already doing. But if you're not, then I hope that this will serve as an admonishment to get busy building the altar using the rocks that you have. The time of building the family altar can be uh, administered in three ways, in my opinion, and that is Bible reading, or Bible time, prayer, and singing. Now, that's a simple formula, but simple does not always make it easy. 
And whether you're single and you're living on your own, whether you're a newlywed couple, you have no children, whether you have 10 kids, whether your kids have already moved on, I call for us to build a family altar where we spend time with whoever is at home reading, praying, and singing. Let's talk about it a little bit deeper. The Bible, Psalm chapter 19, verse 7 through 10, this beautiful scripture about how the law is my delight and how we should have consistent Bible in our home. I'll say this. May your family regularly experience the love and the wonder and the fear of the Lord that comes through the scriptures. I can't help but share some family tidbits, if you will. We're reading through Joshua right now. Joshua and the children of Israel do some pretty, uh, there's some strong cases of judgment that come down on the people of Canaan. And for a six-year-old to hear about how God's wrath comes down on the Canaanites, we're sitting at the breakfast table and there's a lot of faces looking at me like this. The fear of the Lord needs to be taught in our homes. We have a thousand sirens that are screaming at our eyes and ears. Phones and TVs and activities and everything else that is constantly pulling us away. There is almost like this magnetic draw to get to your phone so that you can find out what's going on around the world. Pause your day. Pause with your family and open up the Bible. It can be reading. It can be question and answer time. It can be reenactment. It can be story time. Use the rocks you have. Read the Bible with your family. We need to have consistent prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17 says, Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. Surely we could say that would be with our family. We should pray with our family. That we should be talking about what needs to be prayed about. What's going on in our lives. Let your family know when you are low. Let your family know when you are flying on the wings of eagles. You are so rejoicing about what God has done for you. When your kids are struggling at school, pray for that. Pray for their soul from the moment that they are born to the day that they leave your home. Pray for their salvation. Pray for their future mate and their future mate's salvation. Pray for their job and the wisdom and the opportunity that there is. Use the rocks you have. We can sing. Psalm 100, verse 1 and 2 says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. This one may be the one that is the most difficult for families to do. What if you're a family by yourself? You really want to sing songs? I mean, a lot of you might. Family of two. What if your partner does not like to sing? And they can't stand other people hearing them sing. Use the rocks you have. You know, there's five parts that you can choose to sing when you get together. I didn't, you didn't learn this in singing school. But I'll tell you now, you can sing soprano. You can sing alto, tenor, and bass. And the Psalm 100 said you can also sing a joyful noise. There's five singing parts. And for those of you that can't carry a tune to save your life, and you're thinking, how in the world am I supposed to lead my family in singing? You sing a joyful noise. And when your family sees that you are willing to make a joyful noise to the Lord, man, there's authenticity in that. That this isn't just something we do whenever we go to church, but our family has a culture. It has a Christ-centered culture. We are building that family altar. So use the rocks you have. Now, implementing these practices, I'm going to be presenting it from a structured view. I'm a structured person. I like to have time when we get together and do these things as a family. You might have a free spirit at home. Some people came up to me and they said that. that Jonathan, I just don't know if I want to have this checklist where I have to do these things. If it's a checklist, you know, where you're just doing things to check the list, I recommend that you search in your heart and find the way to make it more authentic. Some people, if they're spirited, while they're going down the road, they're singing songs. Right? They're underneath the car changing the oil, and they're talking Scripture. We can implement this practice as structured or as free-spirited as your family wants. Use the rocks you have. Now, I'd like to provide... Some practical tips for building. So this is specifically for our young people. You may be wondering, how do I build my family altar? For our young families, 
who are still trying to juggle kids sleeping at night, diaper duty and everything else, you've got to build your family altar now. Here's a piece of motivation specifically for you, Dad, husband, man of faith. Prepare your mind and start building now. Do it now. Do it now. If that means you sing on the way home tonight, if you, whatever you want to do, start sooner rather than later. You have to build your altar and bring your family to it. Wives, mothers, support your man in this. It may be that you guys have not read the Bible as a family ever. Or that you've put down the practice of singing or of nighttime prayer for the past six months and you feel like a hypocrite because you haven't done it and suddenly now you're going to try to do this and everybody's saying, we don't do this. What in the world are we doing? So mom, support him. You have a lot of chores a lot of times that need to be done at night. There's a big old pile of dishes. There's a big old pile of laundry. And dad is quite nervous saying, hey, uh, let's all get in the living room. We're going to read a little bit. Please don't tell him, let me finish the dishes. Put the dishes down. Look at your children as they watch you put the dishes down and join the family for worship. Let's have grace with one another. Let's have mercy with one another. Dad, you shouldn't be shouting from the living room. Put the dishes down. Get in here now. And mom, you should have grace with dad whenever he's trying his best to get the family together. Maybe there's not a dad in the home. God is the father of the fatherless. Psalm 65 verse 8. So whoever is the leader of your home, humble yourself on the side of the Lord and build your family altar now. You're on your own and you feel inadequate to the task. Build your family altar now. Use the rocks you have now. And let's have no comparison. There is no uh, uh, looking at other families and feeling like we're inadequate because they're doing such a great job and we can't do a good job and we're nothing like those guys. We are not rooting against each other, but we are rooting for each other. Praise one another when you see families that sing together, that pray together, that are talking about the Bible together. You have that opportunity. Praise them for it. When you have a hospitable home and people come into your home and you're wondering, how am I going to fill two hours with this person tonight? We're going to eat for 30 minutes and then how am I supposed to fill an hour and a half? Why not crack open the Bible? Why not buy five or ten songbooks or I was about to say, steal these songbooks. Are they available to be taken after the meeting? Well, I'm not sure if they are. But find ways to get songbooks. And invite your people to come into your home. Hey, let's sing some songs together. You know what? We've done that. And it does start out awkward sometimes. You think, oh, this it just doesn't feel natural. It doesn't feel... But you know what? You get about halfway through the first verse. And the six-year-olds, the eight-year-olds, the ten-year-olds to start singing their guts out. And people can't help but start singing along with them. Use the rocks you have. Let's talk about practical tips. Number one, stop making excuses. Our family's too small. Our family's too diverse. I can't sing to save my life. I'm not good at leading family worship. I don't know enough about the Bible. I'm afraid what they're going to say. Or what I believe is the most common excuse, we're too busy. Don't make excuses. The problem is not about ability or time. It is about commitment to the Lord. And that might sting. But we all have 24 hours in a day. And what I'm calling for you to do is to stop making excuses if your altar lays bare and get busy building the altar now. Number two, repent. If you haven't been doing it, repent. Confess to your wife. Confess to your children. You want to know something powerful, Dad? is when you call your family together and say, I need your forgiveness because we haven't been doing something and I need to pray about it and I want you to know I'm sorry. For your children to see you model a heart of forgiveness is a powerful thing. So confess and repent. And repentance means change. If your kids are already out of the house and this was something that was just not a part of your life, repent. Help equip your adult children and their families. When your grandchildren or your nieces and nephews come over, have Bible time. Have uh, uh, devotion time where you sing a song with them. Repent. Make it a priority. Talking about how we're too busy, I know what you're going through. Many of you coach. I coached Little League Baseball. And those days are busy. And now my girls want to play soccer. I don't know what in the world we're going to do. Soccer. So un-American. 
So I get it that we've got school and we've got sports and we've got everything else, but you know what? You can be the most scholarly, athletic, musically inclined sinner who goes to hell because you never obeyed the gospel. Or you can be somebody that has a life devoted to Jesus who also happens to play sports and also happens to get straight A's and also works a part-time job. Why? Because you make a priority to build the family altar. Use the rocks you have. The time that you spend as a family has to be jealously guarded. We live in a culture where we are comparing what we're doing to each other. And it's just going crazy right now because I can post not just a picture of my family, but I can make it look real good. And it didn't matter if I had just yelled at this one, if I had just spanked this one, and if I had just griped at that one. I can get them to smile, and I can put it in a filter, and you think my family's got everything figured out. And the same is true with our time. We get so caught up with our time. Make it a priority to build your family altar now. Now saying that, here's the next point. Be flexible. <laughs> Don't make it a checklist where you said, we have got to get in the living room right now, so help me, I don't care if it's 11.30 and we got home from this gospel meeting, we are going to sing five songs tonight. <laughs> I must confess that in the early days of building our family altar, I had to have us present in the living room, and when the girls fell asleep, I did my best to shake our little girls. When our girl, little girls fell asleep, I had to shake them to try to get them to wake back up, and they couldn't wake up to save their life, and I was so frustrated. So frustrated that these girls weren't more spiritually minded. <laughs> There's times when the family altar uh, that we've built means that somebody is rolling around on the floor while I'm trying to tell a Bible story. <laughs> that there's a diaper blowout. <laughs> There's times whenever you might have a teenager who just huffs and puffs and they do not want to be there. They just came from a five hour shift at work and you want us to sit down and do what? I don't care what age the people are, they need to be there. Be flexible. Have grace, have mercy as you try to accomplish this task. I kind of got ahead of myself, but we have to model and expect the right attitude at our family altar. When you want to talk about Bible, when you want to sing, when you want to pray, you need to model. You cannot say, 7.30, everybody get in the living room real quick. This, we're going to, 10 minutes, we're going to knock this out. Okay? We can't say, oh, it's that time again. Get in here. Have joy. Be excited. It is amazing what joy from one person can do to others who might not have joy. And expect the right attitude as much as is possible, because we are going to be flexible, but expect the right attitude from those who are capable of getting the right attitude. There is no slouching. There is no huffing. There is no eye rolling. There is no body language where ones are separating themselves as much as possible from the rest of the family. Expect the right attitude and call people into the Lord's presence whenever you're reading the Bible together or singing or in prayer. And finally, persevere. Every person who I've talked to about this, uh, I've just started giving this sermon uh, a couple times over the last few months. It's been long in the works. But every time when I speak to people, they have to persevere. Those especially who have not been building their family altar, uh, and they, they start to build it. It takes time. I have to praise one family at our home congregation whose dad works really hard and he's out on the road. Maybe that's you, Dad. And uh, Mom was talking to Marissa about this and she said, you know what, uh, we wanted to build our family altar, Dad's not there, and so he FaceTimes in while he's out on the road. And that was really hard for the first two or three times where he's not present but he's there and, and he's trying to lead it and we can't hear him. And it was really hard. But the fourth time, you find that groove. You find that parents with children and you bring them to church and they have trouble staying still. What did you do? Did you say, well, we'll never go to church again? <laughs> you persevere. And the kids learn to sit still. We all did. One way or another, right? And the same is true at the family altar. Persevere. There will be nights when toddlers have trouble. 
There will be nights when teenagers might not want to be there. There will be nights when you can't carry a tune and you have tried to sing that one song and you get to the middle of the chorus and it just falls apart. You did it three times in a row. It falls apart every single time and you're so frustrated. Persevere. Maybe choose a different song. But get through it. Use the rocks you have. I put these scriptures for your consideration one more time. We won't read them, but they have been on my heart as I've been preparing this study, and I hope they will be on your heart as well to show the diligent studying that we must put into the hearts of our families. In conclusion, on February 1st, 2003, the Space Shuttle Columbia disintegrated during atmospheric re-entry. Many of you probably remember when that happened. It's one of two tragedies that our uh, space program has had in the United States. And this is something that we all, it's like, it's like a, a bond of the American people. They've done a really good job of it. We all feel connected. And so we feel connected when this tragedy strikes. It killed all seven crew members instantly. The commander's name was Rick Husband. He's in the bottom left. He was a religious man. They give astronauts last request forms before they depart. They keep them in a little box, and then whenever they return, they're able to get rid of those cards. But they keep them just in case. When tragedy strikes, they get out the cards. Rick Husband's card said, Tell them about Jesus. He's real to me. Can you imagine that? Astronaut saying that today? That feels so, it's like such a long time ago when somebody of such a field would be so bold about their faith. You want to know what's more impressive to me personally about Rick Husband than his last request card? Rick Husband recorded 18 VHS tapes of himself leading family worship. One for each day that he would be gone on his mission. So that every day, Every day, his family could come to the altar. You want to talk about a legacy? I bet they wore those VHS tapes out. What legacy are you leaving your family? What legacy are you building for your family? If you're on your own, teens, young professionals, <coughs> Build your family altar. Work on it now. 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 Don't wait. Start now. And if you haven't started yet, repent and start now. It is a mindset and a practice of bringing our families into consistent and daily devotion with God. Use the rocks you have. Now, the invitation is offered with this question. Did you ever think a pile of rocks could mean so much? Yet I want to refocus back on its primary meaning. That pile of rocks visualizes the restoring of a relationship between you and Jesus Christ through the blood sacrifice that He gave for your sins. Yes, there, it, it pays dividends in thankfulness and bearing witness and inquiry and unity. But the blood sacrifice that Jesus paid, the primary purpose of His spiritual altar was to forgive us of our sins. Sin is treason against a holy God. It's transgression of His holy law. And I and you deserve the punishment that He has asked for. And yet we are able to be substituted because of the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So, as we approach this time of gospel invitation, I wish to say to those who have not been baptized for the remission of sins, who have not come into contact with the blood of the Lamb, what are you waiting for? Why not come tonight? Come believing and repenting. Come confessing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and be baptized. Wash away your sins in the blood of the Lamb. For those of you who are Christians and you need a time of public confession, perhaps there are is a need for you to confess that your altar is so scattered. The rocks are all over the place. And you need to restart tonight. Come, confess, make it right. The church is here to help you. The church wants you to succeed. And if there's one of either class, please come forward as we stand and sing a song.